Too Long Didn't Read, the weekly podcast from the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Hello and welcome to Too Long Didn't Read, your weekly pit stop for the latest in data science and AI news. We read so you don't have to, or more accurately, Smera reads so we don't have to. (laughs) <laughs> you might have clocked on to a slightly higher pitched intro than usual. And that's because Jonah has left me in charge of hosting responsibilities this week. <laughs> <laughs> You've got me, Jesse. You might know me as the silent but vital Jesse, the jester of justice. Jester of justice. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my best to stay behind the scenes so far, but this week I'm stepping in front of the microphone while Jonah is off busying himself with other, more important work, the cheek. I am delighted and relieved uh, to be joined by our ever-faithful, trusty companion, Smera. Smera, you would never let us down, would you? I would not let you down. How how dare Jonah? How dare Jonah? But you know what? He's given me a little gift today. I get to do this entire two hours with you alone. It'll be wonderful. Yay! Girly takeover. <laughs> this week, we talk AI gods, who is and isn't being protected online when it comes to adult entertainment, and what new digital currencies could mean for the economy. A couple of weeks ago, we stumbled upon an article that was published back in March this year by The Conversation titled Gods in the Machine, the Rise of Artificial Intelligence May Result in New Religions. In the article, the author proposes, and I quote, that we are about to witness the birth of a new kind of religion. In the next few years or even months, we will see the emergence of sects devoted to the worship of artificial intelligence. He goes on to argue that people are already seeking religious meaning from alternative sources like extraterrestrials. Uh, So maybe an AI-based religion isn't too far-fetched. Perhaps the most promising part of worshipping an AI deity is the fact that, unlike most other religions, we would actually be able to interact with it on an everyday basis. We could ask it all the big, important questions about life and the world, seek its advice in times of need, tell it about our hopes and fears, and get that immediate feedback that I think many of us would really value from a god. So this was very much an opinion piece, and I couldn't find any hard evidence to support the claims until this week. Smell. <laughs> Tell me about the way of the future church. To give a background on the way of the future church, it was started by Anthony Lewandowski. He mentioned the way of the future church in 2015 first, although it was more formally addressed in 2017. He was an engineer in Google working on their self-driving cars initiative. And after leaving Google, he became an entrepreneur who started an autonomous trucking company called Auto. He then established this so-called church of AI. He claims it is a way to connect spiritually with the material gods and not the human or nature-based gods that we have thus far. But it was shut down in 2020 and its assets were liquidated and interestingly donated to the NAACP for legal action funds, which was very interesting and I didn't expect that correlation. But it is rumoured that he has restarted his his way of the future church. Sorry, did you did you just say entrepreneur? The leader of a religious sect is an entrepreneur. That's got to raise some red flags. I mean, he has quite the background. He was also found guilty of sharing trade secrets and he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. Donald Trump actually pardoned him much later. But yeah, he, he's been found guilty of crimes. So is it religion? For uh, a community group, a non-profit, uh, I, I'm hesitant to say this word, but a cult? Oh, okay. So there's, there's actually a really good book called Cultish that I want to pick up in for, oh, as, as my Christmas reading. So maybe I'll have a bit more information on what constitutes a cult later on. But I, it's very hard, though, as of now, to really draw a clear line between religion, community groups, or even cults. Um, take Hinduism, for example. Many argue it is a philosophy where you can 
pick the elements that you wish to practice and the aspects that you want to engage with spiritually, even the deities that you want to worship, right? That philosophy has now taken over even local traditions and tribal traditions, bringing tribal deities and local gods of nature into a more structured pantheon of over a thousand gods that make up the Hindu, you know, list of gods that exist. So you can argue Hinduism is a philosophy, it is a religion, but it is also nature worship that's all wrapped up into one. So it's it's very hard to really draw the divisions between all of this. Even the different versions of Abrahamic religions, be it Islam or Christianity, there are so many debates on what the nature of God even is and what Jesus is. Is he God or is he the son of God? And what's the role of the spirit? So Jesus tends to, in these debates, Jesus tends to exist in this quantum state of being both a God and not a God, depending on who opens the box. Funny little quantum joke for everyone. (laughs) I mean, this is all to say that our wide and varied interpretations of religion, they influence how humans behave. And we often tend to need these ideas of spirituality and belief to feel grounded. As for the way of the future church, it seems to be a spiritual group, but the European Academy of Religion and Society have called it a cult. Okay. So what is the actual definition of a cult? A cult is seen as having more fringe belief systems. So AI worship could be seen as a fringe belief system in that sense. Okay, so aside from the very obvious untraditional nature of all of this, as far as religious followings go, how traditional are the religious aspects? Like, are there rules of worship? prayers, anything like that? Does it have divine characteristics? Is it omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent? All of those <laughs> all of those things that we characterize as religious. You see, so a lot of people believe generative AI and AGI or artificial general intelligence would be omnipotent and omnipresent. So, but the way of the future church believes that AI is temperamental and we must approach it with the divinity and consuming power that it has. From what I understand, they don't have any traditional worship aspects, but Neil MacArthur, the author of the article that you'd mentioned in our introduction, believes that these religions around AI might arise from two general ideas. Uh, One is that people would be in awe of this kind of technology, that it is so powerful, it's capable of doing so much. And the other would be the belief that AI is sentient, which is very scary. (laughs) So when it comes to awe technology or the first route that he identifies, we could compare it to, you know, the awe that a lot of uh, religious systems have on the, the role that nature plays to, you know, bring down earthquakes and, you know, massive typhoons if, you know, you're not if you're not living a good life and so on and so forth. But it's really, really concerning if people start believing AI has sentience. It's one thing to be at all be in awe of AI, but it's another thing entirely to believe that AI is making these decisions entirely by itself. And this has been an argument that's been made by numerous academics that AI is not sentient. It is just making probabilistic answers that could convince a vulnerable person, I would say. Didn't take you long to get those vulnerable groups in. <laughs> right, we've, uh, we've talked about existential risk before. The idea that machines may one day get so intelligent that they pose a serious threat to humans. One example would be, as you just mentioned, the AI singularity, Mm -hmm. the idea that AI could one day become more intelligent than us and then completely take over, rewrite its code, irreversible effects, that kind of thing. Um, And it seems far-fetched and so far into the future that it's perhaps not worth worrying about just yet. How does the rise of AI religion play into this debate? Mm. Because honestly, if this picks up speed, with the help of a large enough devout human following, I can kind of see the AI taking over. (laughs) What do you think? (laughs) To be fair, Neil MacArthur's uh, paper that we mentioned about a few times and would be in the show notes, uh, he, he does he does do the math behind it. And they're like, if enough number of people interact with ChatGPT and see it as a god, even a fraction of them would overtake Scientology in terms of followers of the belief. Instead of thinking about the AI singularity and whether it's going to happen, especially in a conversation about religion, it would probably help to think about why people would want to believe in that religion itself, or e- even or rather why people would want 
want to believe in the idea that AI is going to take over with things that change so often around us we want a sense of meaning to be given either as to why we exist in this world what our role is that we play in this world who created this world and so on some people can turn to science to answer these big questions but a lot of people want something more than that as to what drives us to do certain things so with that meaning making you can understand why people might want to turn towards ai possibly giving that kind of an answer so people might turn to that purely because of this innate human characteristic that we have and our drive for creating meaning and our drive to be a part of a larger community i have to say you very skillfully dodged that question smara and that makes me wonder if you are <laughs> a little bit scared that the ai singularity is coming <laughs> I'm more scared that people will believe it's going to happen which is why like you know we shouldn't push people to the fringes where they don't understand this and they think 5G is going to take over time to put our tin foil hats on instead you know bring everyone you know give people a shared vocabulary give people an understanding of what this technology means so they don't think that it's this omnipotent being that can take over the world has the answers to everything it has answers to nothing nothing more than what us humans have answers to so uh well all right i mean you're not saying much but i will just cover myself now by pledging my <laughs> allegiance to the almighty ai <laughs> in chat gpt we trust <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be burned at the stake for the blasphemy I've done, you know, just throughout this podcast against AGI AI. So if there's an AI god, I am definitely not in their more positive spirits. You're going to get an old control delete for your blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> Smera, shall we do porn? I don't need a deep fake of me saying random stuff. If you just ask me questions like this, it'd be like, "Well, but I did in fact say yes." I let's do porn on a, on a, on a podcast. <laughs> um, this week, Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator, set out its draft guidance for protecting children from pornographic websites. According to a survey carried out by the Children's Commissioner. The average age children first view pornography is 13, with 1 in 10 children having viewed this kind of content at 9. Worse still, nearly 8 in 10 people under the age of 18 have encountered violent pornography depicting coercive, degrading or pain-inducing mm-hmm. sex acts. Smera, how in 2023 have we not got a handle on this yet? I was pretty sure we had some strict laws in place to cover this kind of stuff. What's the deal? So there are general laws for the protection of children, but when it comes to their interaction in online spaces, um, their protection is ensured by the recent Online Safety Act, which was passed this year. Ofcom would be expected to play the role of the regulator and fine companies if they contravene on any parts of this new act, but. the way the government has altered the act and and the number of the debates that have gone on until these this act was passed into law means that social media platforms and messaging sites amongst many other online spaces would have to provide a legal black door for governments to oversee conversation and call out any harmful behavior so either the platform itself would have to monitor the messages shared between two people or the government would be able Or, or they should allow the government to be able to scan those messages for harmful content and this would directly oppose you know concerns of privacy and would essentially allow governments to have proper surveillance of messaging between people do away with the end to end encryption that we have on sites like you know um whatsapp but for for now it does give a bit of comfort comfort to know that this has been postponed because such message scanning technology is not available at the moment okay um so ofcom have provided a list of what they call highly effective methods of age assurance this list includes checking if the user has previously had age restrictions removed from a mobile phone credit card checks digital id wallets uh, that store a user's proof of age mm. facial age estimation which i will say doesn't sound highly <laughs> effective to me um what with the word estimation in there but okay um, and 
And requiring government photographic ID, such as passport or driving license. It sounds like a step in the right direction. <laughs> it's not. I mean, we can't even take facial age estimation seriously. There are times I'm ID'd. There are times that I'm not. To note, I'm 26. I, I don't know how many people can tell I'm 26, but there are a lot of people who would regularly ID me, right? So that doesn't make sense. And then there are people who possibly just have younger looking features. So does that mean they constantly have to prove their age? And even, I get, uh, yeah, I get ID'd yeah. at 34 sometimes. To be sometimes. fair, you are, you are a stunning and very youthful looking 34 oh. year old, you know? Yeah, I'll come back. I'll do this again. <laughs> I don't know how much I could say it's a step in the right direction because this even just the scanning of these faces especially children could open a lot of concerns on privacy there could be data theft and that could expose a lot of young children yeah so the the protection itself is still putting children at risk uh, just mm -hmm. just in a different way and not to mention I would assume lots of other people for various reasons all I have to say on this is that even Pornhub, which is the world's leading distributor of this content, said the regulation would put users' safety in jeopardy. If such content is even regulated in this way, children may turn to other parts of the internet that aren't as regulated. And the content on the deep web, and especially the people who, who usually tend to use the deep web, is an even bigger cause of concern. But that can't be as easily regulated. So what's happening here is that you're putting these laws, but these laws laws might push children to view to exposing themselves to even more gruesome and violent content. When we first started this podcast, I never thought in a million years that we would be quoting Pornhub. But here we are. Yeah, I know. Neither did I. Neither I didn't think of all spaces Pornhub would be the one yeah. we turned to for saying even they're saying it's bad, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. So we have Plenty of laws in place to protect children on the internet, including internet pornography, which is great. Uh, but when it mm -hmm. comes to adults, my next story suggests we might be lagging. Uh, so I've seen quite a few stories, actually, in the last couple of weeks, months. Actually, mm -hmm. for a long time, I've been seeing these stories crop up. Um mm -hmm about victims of deep fake porn, uh, deep fake nudes, um, mm. and the fact that the, the victims have absolutely nowhere to go. There were, there are no laws in place to protect them. Mm -hmm. uh, these stories are becoming more and more frequent. There are, there are documentaries. It's, mm. it's a big problem. What's going on? Where are we? I mean, the Online Safety Act does make the sharing of deepfake porn or threats of rape online illegal. But the creation of deepfakes itself, without consent, because apparently I have to mention that as well, is a lot more legally ambiguous. So you could create it, but there's the law specifically speaks to the sharing of such content, not really addressing the creation of such content itself. Going back to how we started this conversation, to even find out who made something there would have to be oversight and people, you know, going into the private messages of certain groups of people. And that would mean the end of end to end encryption. Sure, we can say that, you know, if it's someone in our vicinity and you have an idea of who might have potentially created that in our close circles, it might be possible. But if you're a celebrity, anyone on the Internet could be behind the creation of your defects. So how are you going to find the person who actually created this? So there's there's a lot. It's really hard to like regulate against that, I believe. This story reminded me of a cheering lecture we organised back in 2019 with Professor Lillian Edwards on deep fakes, revenge porn and fake news. And I will say it is absolutely brilliant uh, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Although uh, I will also say there is a lot of adult language in there. I think I, I counted off every popular swear word in the English language <laughs> during that lecture, but it's very good. Um, so in the lecture, she presented some fairly rudimentary examples of the technology across different use cases. So porn, politics, evidence in court cases, uh, and warned that it probably wouldn't be too long before this really blew up and became a massive problem. Four years later, and she was absolutely right, but it seems like we're still very much at square one in terms of protecting people from the very real harms this stuff is capable of causing. How have we got here? 
And there's that interesting story in the in the in the Turing lecture that she speaks about one of the people who first started off with deep fake nudes, and he realized that oh, you can use generative um, what general advers- adversarial networks to kind of play around with the light, and if you could do that, you could probably use it to create nudes of a person. And he gave multiple speeches about it and spoke about it like it's a funny thing, and that he did it on multiple you know images that he had, and I don't know how many of those people consented to his, their images being used that way but the fact that you you know we live in an an age where someone can do something like this and they are actually given a platform to speak about it and not immediately ostracized for the kind of behavior they're engaging in like that's that's scary yeah i don't know anyone who would consent to that and i i'm i'm pretty uh pretty generous with my data when it when it comes to research purposes i will generally let people use my data yeah. for all manner of things if it's going to support scientific research but uh yeah. i think i would draw the line at deep fake nudes i think it points to a big issue in more the social elements and the environments that we live in the people being exposed to this content we need to start thinking about why children would want to access that we have to start thinking about making sure you know sex education is given in a way that people fully understand what it means and children don't grow up wanting to emulate what they see on these websites i think that's the space that we need to start working on not just putting out technical regulations that oh we banned this we put a watermark on this like that's just not enough smara are you a cash gal or a card gal i forgot the last time i took my card out in public oh you're not even so you're you're a phone tappy gal mm mm I, I don't trust myself me, with carrying a card around and I've never I I don't like using a wallet. I that's very unsafe. Yeah, I'm a tappy <laughs> gal. Uh but I do I do get very excited by the novelty of cash, but um it, I can't spend cash. Like I have to keep it for an emergency. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's it it feels somewhat pointless. I I keep I only keep cash whenever I go to like the Lewisham market because they only accept cash. So if I ever want like bulk vegetables, that's when, you know, I I take the cash, but that's pretty much the only time I use it. I really struggle to actually spend cash, and to be fair, the world makes it pretty difficult to spend cash now too. As far as I know, everything is digital now apart from uh Lewisham market apparently. <laughs> um which is why my next story both surprised and confused me in equal measure. The Bank of England has been cooking up plans to release a digital pound sometime before 2030. Smera, what is a digital pound if it's not the kind I use to pay for my online shopping habit? So I thought it was the same and I couldn't really understand until I watched multiple videos and I finally figured it out. So a digital pound or a digital sterling would be issued by the Bank of England itself, so by a central bank essentially, and it would be backed by the government. Bitcoin as it might be co- as it might be coined, haha. <laughs> nice. Would <laughs> So Bitcoin would be pegged to the sterling. So 1 pound is 1 Bitcoin and or 1 1 digital pound. Um, it would essentially do away with the middle commercial banks. So we might use someone like Barclays in the middle or, you know, NatWest. And you would essentially not have that middle commercial bank. If you want to buy Britney or Michael Jordan, a cute Christmas jumper, by the way, Britney and Michael Jordan are Jesse's lovely dogs. Um, but if you were, if you wanted to buy them a Christmas jumper on a website, you would use Apple Pay or your credit or debit card, right, to, to make those transactions. In order to do that, there's a transaction fee that the commercial bank would take. There's also fees that go through um, Visa and MasterCard who usually carry out some of these transactions. And by getting rid of them, you would essentially be taking the pound from your bank and paying for something directly without having those transaction fees in the middle, is what I understand it to be. The FCA say that this new digital currency is not a cryptocurrency, Mm -hmm. but it does use distributed ledger technology technology otherwise known as blockchain, which is 
really, really useful information for someone who understands what any of those things are. <laughs> so help me out, Samara. To understand cryptocurrency, there's a history behind it. And Satoshi Nakamoto uh, began, he's this amorphous, you know, internet entity. No one really knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. But he started Bitcoin. And the idea was that you would, that there is this distributed ledger technology that's decentralized. You would not need a commercial bank who is, who has oversight over all of these, nor would you have the central bank of a country. Instead, you would have a ledger system where everyone would have access to this data and the data data is encapsulated in a block. The block would include the data of the person who's sending the money, the amount they're sending, and to whom they're sending it. And that block would also include a unique fingerprint of sorts called a hash, and the hash of the previous block that exists. So if anyone's using that cryptocurrency and they feel that there's an irregularity, they can match it up to the previous trans- the previous hash that took place. And This is all done to ensure that there is no reliance on these banks and that people can access and have oversight of their money by themselves, their cryptocurrency by themselves. Where it differs in the case of Bitcoin or digital currencies that people use is that the central banks would be in charge of giving out this money. So it's completely antithetical to what you know, cryptocurrency was because you literally have the central bank of a country issuing this, but it's not cryptocurrency because it is going to be centralized by the the Bank of England. And the Bank of England, very importantly, is not a commercial bank, just as central bank or the reserve banks of certain countries are not a commercial bank. The central bank determines how much money commercial banks have. They print out the the cash, the physical cash that we use as well. And they're really important in setting out monetary policies for the year. So when people say, oh, the Bank of England's raising their interest rates, that's usually to respond to economic trends of inflation or recession or worries of the two to make sure that the amount of money in circulation is reduced or increased to respond to demand and supply and all of those economic a- angles to it. Okay, Smera. So imagine for one moment that you are speaking to someone who has absolutely no concept of how (laughs) the economy works. Not me, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for a friend. Just just imagine. um, (laughs) To help that mystery person understand, could you provide me with a list of pros and cons for this new system? Let's Mm -hmm. start with the pros. So in terms of positives, many, the banks that are trialing, the central banks that are trialing these assets and many of its proponents believe that central banks controlling the flow of trade more directly would mean that they can control the assets of individuals as well as foreign entities that hold their reserve, hold this currency. So if you take sanctions, they would be more, they, they could be enforced with more immediate action rather than the different ways that we currently deal with having to enforce sanctions. A more immediate importance for, for people like you and me would be there'd be fewer costs in carrying out those transactions without a commercial bank. And there would also be fewer delays in global transactions. So if I were to send money to India, there are delays. It might take two days before the money finally reaches. And then there's a lot of costs associated because the commercial bank has to keep record of these different transactions that are taking place. And that is a cost that I will have to bear. But some believe that by linking these digital currencies, these remittances can be made more easy. And if we're traveling abroad, we can we can pay in their local currency without facing so many of those transaction costs. Some even claim that it could help integrate a more digital form of payment for especially for people who may have who may struggle with opening up commercial bank accounts. Okay, uh, hit me with the risks. So beginning from the last point of, you know, helping the unbanked, so to speak, in order to do that, you would need access to a smartphone. But a lot of people just don't have access to a smartphone. And you can't just use any other brick phone to carry out these transactions. It would indeed have to be a smartphone. So I, I don't know how much can actually be said that it's going to improve the the status of the unbanked in in our society. You know, of course, there are the data worries of going digital, such as data theft and the theft that might happen, you know, if we move increasingly to digital systems that don't have sufficient cybersecurity measures in place. There's also a big worry on the role of big tech companies and the digital wallets that they might begin using and saying, hey, 
load your money onto this wallet and we will give you you know 5% cash back on amazon um you know deliveries or if you load it onto your starbucks card you'll get like uh, you know 5% off on each drink and it could possibly incentivize a few people to want to use it but in the long run that means reliance on a big tech company and there are worries of them also taking over in this in this sense uh, yeah that's a scary thought and i I know that if I was offered the promise of 5% off my Starbucks, I feel like all good sense and morals would go out of the window. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, take it all, take all my money. (laughs) Um, You haven't even mentioned vulnerable groups yet. I think that's because all of us would be vulnerable groups. <laughs> Everyone is vulnerable on the cyberspace. And if we have more and more reliance on these digital forms of payment, there's more and more reliance on the cyberspace, which, as you mentioned in previous episodes, are regularly subject to data thefts, hacking, ransomware and whatnot that can put all the money that we've ever saved up over all these years at risk. To be clear, so if and when this digital pound comes in, Mm -hmm. that will completely replace the use of debit card or or we'll we'll just have options for both yeah so what so what countries are trying to do in their trialing of these is that they don't fully phase out commercial banks and that's really important because usually central banks have to be the lender of the last resort they're the lender of the last resort to their own people, to their own commercial banks who might be running low on reserves. And this goes back to like basics of banking. You can't fully do away with that system because who are you going to get loans from? You can't do it straight from the government. So they can't end up totally phasing out these commercial banks because they create this extremely important part of our banking infrastructure right now. So the idea is that they're going to start introducing these digital currencies to start getting people to digitize more of their payments. But it is both not going to replace commercial banks, nor is it going going to, um, you know, replace cash in entirety. So, as you know, Jesse, uh, I've stopped giving the positive news because as Jora described me, I'm, uh, I'm, I think he called me a Gen Z, but I don't know. what. I, I think but, he just said a, a, a 20-something little emo kid. <laughs> So I'd rather you give me a piece of positive news, you know, with your infinite sources of wisdom that you've accrued over the years you have been alive. <laughs> Come on, hit me. What do we have to feel positive about? Uh, all right, let me, let me start with a disclaimer. This isn't really news and it's not necessarily going to be positive for everyone, but it was positive for me. And I was really happy mm-hmm. to see this article titled, AI predicts majority of the world will be vegan by 2075, thanks to Gen Z and millennials. That's us. You're welcome, world. Woohoo! I think that that's really interesting. I did have a stint with being a vegan for a bit and my family still doesn't let go of how I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to, I don't eat meat. I don't eat dairy. I don't eat anything. And yeah, I've I've regularly had phases where I boycott certain types of food and companies and my parents love to make fun of the fact that this lasts about like a year at most and then then I move on. So I think I deserve a bit of a pat on the back because we are well over an hour into recording and I have still not mentioned the fact that I'm vegan yet, which you know, for, <laughs> for a vegan is a very big deal, mm-hmm. but we're mm-hmm. here now mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't have this platform and not, not talk that's about true. it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's why we're deplatforming you from next week. Yeah. <laughs> Um, coming on here with your vegan agenda <laughs> yeah I'm so, honestly this story did come up this week uh, and so it was perfect timing but mm-hmm. I said it wasn't news why isn't it news uh, because the prediction comes from our good old friend chat GPT mm-hmm. how much we should really be reading into this I wouldn't want to say but I don't think it's totally unthinkable to think that it could come true I mean, I mean, it is trained on data. If I'm going to use the same data point for other yeah, arguments on why yeah. ChatGPT is bad, it is also trained on the data that we usually that that's recorded, and that it it does seem to show there's a reflection of how our current eating habits and drinking habits are maybe increasingly vegan. It's also interesting to note that ChatGPT 
is more liberal than it is conservative because of the text that's available on the internet or the text used to train the model. So ah. we're looking at a liberal vegan agenda influenced to 2075. <laughs> so ChatGPT was asked to produce a timeline of the world going vegan starting in 2024 when you and mm-hmm. I, that's Gen Z and millennials, raise awareness of agriculture. By 2027, mm-hmm. the term flexitarian, which is a term I, I really dislike, but um, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, yeah. the term flexitarian will become common. So that's why 2027. Uh, and then the mm-hmm. article skips about 50 years and we end up in 2073 <laughs> when almost the entire world is vegan. And I don't know what happened in that 50 years, but apparently <laughs> it was a lot. Happy days, happy days. As an OG yeah. vegan who single-handedly paved the way, that's not true, uh, for this potential future. I'd like to take all the credit for this prediction. Thank you and good night. (laughs) So that's it from me and Smera. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All that's left for me to say is thank you to Smera for your profound wisdom and support and for just Mm -hmm. being a babe Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and thank you to Jonah who put me in this position and who also has the unenviable task of of editing this podcast Um, and of course thank you good luck (laughs) and of course thank you to you lovely listeners please like subscribe share uh, and send fan mail to podcast at turing.ac.uk smear us sitting here Please waiting. let us know. <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at Turing Inst uh, and on Instagram at The Turing Inst. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye from me. 